Music is clear evidence of God's existence. I'm not quite done letting that sink in. That was gorgeous. It really, what do you do with music if you choose to believe that this world came into being through evolutionary processes? What do you do with music? What tribe of baboons was it that decided they could escape the tiger faster if they sang different frequencies in sequence? It's just there for sheer beauty. God is a God of beauty. I loved it. That was a sermon in and of itself. Well, that's what I was hearing. I I thought, is anyone else hearing that buzz? (laughs) A lot of things on my body started falling apart in recent years, and I thought, now my hearing's going. But there really was something going on. I was at church one time where they were lowering the screen just like that, and there were some pigeons hiding behind it. And no sooner had it hit the bottom than three pigeons launched out into the congregation and started diving over people's heads. Very hard to regain control after that. Our scripture reading this morning came from one of the toughest chapters of the Bible. I mean, it starts out okay, doesn't it? Hebrews 11. Full of the heroes of the faith. You've got Noah who builds the ark and becomes a household name for every child in Western civilization and beyond. You've got Moses who watches the Red Sea part. He leads God's people across to the other side on dry ground. You've got Abraham, a man who becomes so legendary that to this day... Three of the world's major religions, all three of the big monotheistic religions, claim him as their great-granddaddy. Half the world's population lays claim to Abraham. You've got Rahab in chapter 11, a Canaanite prostitute who, exercising the height of courage, hides two Hebrew slaves in her home, risking her own life, and she becomes a great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother to Jesus. It's an amazing chapter. It's phenomenal. But then you get down to the end, which is where our scripture reading came from today. And you have some of the toughest words in the Bible, at least for me. Hebrews 11.39. I'll read them. We're going to pray and we're going to study it. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. All these people were faithful. They give their whole lives to God. They followed the Lamb wherever He led them. And not one of them got what they were promised. Not one. They received not the promise. Now that's what we're going to look at this morning because that verse has everything to do with Bible prophecy, but more importantly, it has everything to do with the question, can I trust God with my future? I'm going to be speaking this morning and telling some stories that maybe I've told here and there in places. And I used to preach this topic because it was comforting from the Bible, but it was largely theoretical. In recent years, though, it's become deeply personal. I don't know if you've ever suffered a horrible disappointment in life, a shattering one that made you question everything, but I have. And I'll be speaking from experience. As we move into the study, it's going to assume that perhaps you have a little bit of a background in Bible prophecy, but if you don't, that's okay. Because then it's meant to pique your curiosity and make you want to ask Pastor Jeff, how can I study more and know more about prophecy? And I know he'll be happy to help you. Some of the things that I allude to might challenge the way you've always thought about things. That's on purpose too. I want you to go back and study. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Father in heaven, as we turn to the pages of the Bible, again we know that this is not like other books. This is not mere human opinion. This is not an advice column. This is the almighty creator revealing himself to us. This is the voice of Jesus Christ. And I know that I'm not fit to speak anything out of the Bible except that you have invited me before the throne of grace and you've forgiven my sin. And I ask again this morning that you would make me fit 
that I would be able to speak words that Jesus would speak. That I'd be able to say things that put a smile on your face because they're truth and from the Word. Bless our study together, and when we hear Jesus speak to us, we will follow Him wherever He takes us, and we'll trust. We covenant that with you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. In the 11th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is meeting with His disciples, and He's having a private time with them. You know, some of the stories in the Bible, Jesus is spending time with large crowds of people and speaking to them, and a lot of those words are recorded for our benefit. But sometimes he gets together with just the twelve and he speaks to them. And oh, how I wish I could have been there to listen to that. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus calls twelve disciples. He gets them together. He's speaking to them in private. And as the discussion is coming to an end and Jesus is just about to go back out on the trail and minister to the larger crowd, speak to the bigger groups, some guys show up. And they start asking some really awkward questions of Jesus. Master, they say, people say you're Messiah. Are you really Messiah? Are you really the one we've been expecting? Are you really Shiloh? Are you really the long-awaited root of Jesse? Is that who you are, or have we made a mistake? Because you see, while you're out here enjoying this time with your disciples, and while you're free to go out and preach, our Master, John the Baptist, is rotting in a prison cell, and it doesn't look good. He may never come out again. Have we made a mistake? Are you Him? Of course, as you dig around in that story, you discover it's not really the disciples of John the Baptist who are asking Jesus that question. It's John the Baptist himself, but he can't come in person, so he sends his disciples to ask, Are you really Him? Because after years in the desert, after years of preaching a distinctly prophetic message, after years of telling people Messiah is coming, the first coming of Christ is about to happen, it's starting to look to John like he might be wrong. He's in jail. He's confused. Matthew 11, verse 2. And when John heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Go back and tell John, yes, I am. Go tell him what you saw. But you know what Jesus doesn't say? Go tell John it's all going to be okay. Go tell John that he's going to come back out of prison and he'll be free to join me here preaching. It doesn't end that way. Jesus just says, go and tell him he's right about the prophecies. Go and tell him he's right about who I am. Now that is a very strange story if you think about it. I mean, why would that story be included in the Bible? That is the very thing that we hear about John the Baptist. That's the final story about him. I mean, other than the final story about him, this is the last thing we hear from John. There's no final sermon that he gives that makes up one of those grand chapters of the Bible. John does not go on to write a chapter or a book of the Bible. There's no great miracle in the end. There's no getting caught up into heaven. You just have John the Baptist, a man the Bible says is the greatest prophet who ever lived. He's sitting in a prison cell and he's confused. Utterly confused about prophecy. And the question I want you to think about is, why is that story there? Why does God put that in the pages of the Bible? Why that story about John the Baptist? You know, when you first start studying Bible prophecy, it's pretty exciting stuff. I mean, Daniel 2 that we looked at last night, that really got my motor running. It showed me beyond the shadow of a doubt that there's something out there besides me. It really is something guiding human history, and it's not all an accident. It gets you excited. It gives you a level of confidence. Then you read Revelation chapter 14, right in the pinnacle, right in the heart of Revelation. You see this group of people standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb of God, and they are God's last day people. And as you study that chapter, and you study the message that they have for the world in Revelation chapter 14, fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Worship Him who made. When you see that, and you begin to realize 
That's not some abstract group way down in the future. That's not just a group of other people that I observe from the outside. That's a group of people that we're being invited to join. We are that final generation. We are the ones who herald the second coming of Christ. We are, it looks very clearly now, like we are the final generations to live on this planet. God's saying that's not just some group. That could be you. I'm inviting you in. Oh my goodness, it feels good when you realize that. And then you start Revelation 12 and 13 and 14 and you look at the heart of it those three angels messages right there in the center of the book of Revelation right there the peak of that message when you start to realize just how profound those messages are when you realize that all the roads in Bible prophecy lead to that central chapter and then all the roads lead from that central chapter again when you realize that you can explore just about every subject starting there in Revelation 12, 13, and 14 when you pick up those prophecies and you turn them like a lens on the rest of the Bible it's really exciting because all of a sudden for the first time sometimes all the questions you've had all the loose ends, all the stuff that didn't make sense, all those stories in the Bible that you couldn't quite figure out, when you look at them through the lens of Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation, all of a sudden it all starts to make sense. It's like climbing Chimney Rock. You get up there and for the first time in your life you've got a 360 degree view. You can see in every direction and it all starts to make sense. Things that didn't make sense start to become really clear. I can remember some of the things that became clear for me wondered all my life, what's it going to be like when Jesus comes back? My parents, I think I mentioned it last night, bought me a Bible when I was a little boy. It's the first book I ever read. It wasn't a scholarly edition. I still have it on my shelf, though. It's got a place of honor. I think that's the finest gift parents could buy a child. I read it. It was a paraphrase. It wasn't a particularly good edition. I wouldn't preach from it today, but I used to open that up when I was a little boy and read about the second coming of Christ, and I would literally get so excited that I would run outside and look up in the sky to see if I could see Him coming now. It just seemed so real. I loved it. Then I wanted to know more about the second coming of Christ. And so one afternoon, I, I was going through my grandfather's library. He had all kinds of books about religion and Christianity and the Bible. And I found a book on the second coming of Christ. And I was so excited, here's more about the second coming. And I did something that's probably wrong. I stole a book on the second coming of Christ. And I took it home to my bedroom. I started to thumb through it and it told some fantastic stories about Jesus and how he would come. The only problem was as I compared that book with the Bible that my parents had given me, it didn't connect. It didn't add up. It had some confusing details that I just couldn't find anywhere in the pages of Scripture. But then... When I went to Revelation chapter 14 and I looked at the Bible through the lens of the three angels' messages, all of a sudden it became really clear. I mean, the story of the second coming of Christ is so simple the way it's told in the Bible. There's not a lot of confusion about it. When Jesus comes, every eye will see Him. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. When Jesus comes, every ear will hear Him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, Psalm 50 verse 3. Everybody hears it. Everybody sees it. It is audible. It is visible. It is glorious. It is final. It's so simple when Jesus Jesus comes. He just comes. Amen. Loved it. Became clear to me. I used to wonder sometimes, too, what happened when somebody died. I used to be on my best behavior after a family member died for about two weeks because I was afraid that they would watch what I was doing and whisper it in God's ear and then I'd get in trouble. I know that doesn't make sense, like God can get anyway, but I was on best behavior if Old Uncle Amel died, then I better be careful because he's probably reporting on me right now. I mean, that's the way I thought about it when I was a little kid. And then I read in Revelation 14, Blessed are they that die in the Lord henceforth, for they shall rest from their labors. Job chapter 7 said, The dead never come back to their house. Ecclesiastes 9 said, The dead have nothing to do. They can't connect with me. They're not watching me. They're not ratting me out. Oh, it felt good to know what the Bible actually said. Then at age 12, I got dragged to catechism class. I don't know if any of you ever got dragged to catechism class. I had to do it every Tuesday night. We had to memorize it. We had to memorize pages and pages and pages of catechism. And I remember in the church I was reared in, they taught us that God chooses people ahead of time to be saved or lost. Before you're even born, He makes that decision and you can't change a thing about it. You're either in the kingdom or you're out of the kingdom and it's already been determined for you. And they called it the doctrine of election and the doctrine of divine reprobation. And it bothered me. You mean it's already been determined? 
And I remember asking the pastor, well, how do I know? I mean, which group am I in? What if I was born to be lost and I've lived my whole life for God and then when I get to the finish line, God says, well, you nice try, but you're out. I decided that before you were born. How do I know, pastor? How do I know? And he said, well, Sean, if you're even worried about it, you're probably okay. I didn't want probably. I didn't want probably. I've noticed, I know it's kind of young to start on this topic, but I've noticed since the age of eight that death has been stalking me. It catches up to all of us. And I don't want probably, I don't want maybe, I don't want what if. When my turn comes, if Jesus hasn't quite come yet, when my turn comes to, get, to be lowered into that hole in the ground and you're all there and you sprinkle dirt on my casket and you go back to the church for a potluck, but I'm still out there in the graveyard, I don't want maybe. I don't want maybe. So imagine how good it felt when I saw what the Bible actually said. You can know. The Bible says Jesus knows where those graves are. He calls them open when He comes again. He calls us by name, John chapter 5. Imagine when I saw in 1 John 5, it was an evangelist who showed this to me. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may feel like you have eternal life? Not a chance. God says you can know. That feels good. By faith I know I'm okay with God. The more I study it, the better it feels. It gets better with time like your marriage. I've been married 20 years. And it feels good. I can't wait for 40 and 50 years because I'm going to just explode with excitement. I love being married. That's the way it is with the Word of God. The more you study it, the more you love it. It feels good to know for sure. All of a sudden, world events aren't scary. They make sense. You can see God's nudging everything toward the second coming of Christ. History makes sense. For the first time, when you look at it through the lens of Bible, in high school, I hated history. Hated it. What was the point, I said to the teacher? These people are all dead. We can't change a bit of it. I mean, it's done. Let's look at the future. I didn't get it at all. But now, through the lens of Bible prophecy, I can see all of history. No matter who wrote the history book, you'll find Jesus there. Everything's moving toward the second coming of Christ. History's exciting. I love knowing. It feels great to know for sure that I can trust God without a shadow of a doubt with my future. feels awesome. But then, I started asking another question. What would happen if all of a sudden you came under the distinct impression that maybe you were wrong about all this stuff? I mean, what if the evidence of your senses, the stuff you see and hear and touch, taste, feel, what if all the evidence starts to point in another direction? What do you mean, Joe? Well, that's a possibility you have to consider because the man that Jesus called the greatest prophet who ever lived suddenly finds himself utterly confused about the very thing he preached. He's confused about Bible prophecy. In his mind, the kingdom should already be established. He should not be rotting in a prison cell. He should be out there preaching on the streets with Jesus. And as his story comes to an end, he's in jail and he's confused. And I feel sorry for him. Because he can't even read some of the stories that we read for comfort. Right? He can't read Jesus telling his disciples, look, after I go back to heaven, you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be tough times. Jesus hadn't preached that yet. He can't read that. New Testament hasn't been written. He can't read about the prediction that Jerusalem would be destroyed. He can't even read about the crucifixion of Christ. It hasn't happened yet. He can't look at the book of Revelation and see the long, hard road that laid ahead for the Christian. He can't see any of that stuff. Couldn't see the passage we read this morning. Let us run with patience. The race is set before us. Couldn't see any of that got to wonder, why is that story in the Bible? 1921. Hard to believe that's almost 100 years ago. 1921, a couple, David and Svea, are living in Sweden in their comfortable little home. It's nice. It's not fancy, but it's nice and it's comfortable. And suddenly they started to come under conviction that God was asking them to do something different with their lives. One night, Svea comes to David and says, David, you know, I've been thinking. And he says, you know, it's funny, I've been thinking too. Something's up. Yes, it is, David. 
How can we be comfortable here in our home when the whole world is going to their graves without knowing Jesus? How can we be comfortable anymore? How can we? We've got to do something. And they wrestled with it, and they prayed about it, and in the irresistible, in an answer to the irresistible call of God, they signed up as missionaries with their missionary society. And they packed their bags, and they took their little two-year-old son, and they went to the Belgian Congo. I don't know how many of you have perhaps ever been to the Belgian Congo. It is not a comfortable place at all. They got down there to the mission station in the Belgian Congo, and they met another couple, the Ericsons. So now there's five of them. David and Savea, their two-year-old boy, and Mr. and Mrs. Erickson. I don't know their first names. And from the mission station, they made their way into the jungle, and they came across a little village by the name of Endelera. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I don't speak the language of those who built the village. Endelera. And five minutes after making contact with the people who lived in that village, they realized they were in for a tough time because the village chief wanted nothing to do with them. He was afraid. He said to his people, don't talk to these missionaries because if we talk to these missionaries, the gods that we worship will get angry and make our lives hard. And sometimes we laugh at that, saying, oh, what a simpleton. But until you've been in those places and looked at those situations, you don't understand. That really does happen. Some people that are steeped in idolatry and superstition and worshiping spirits really do have a hard time when missionaries show up. There are forces in this universe that turn all their wrath against those people. So the chief of the village banned the missionaries completely. They weren't allowed into town at all. So they were forced to go a half mile down the road where they built a couple of little mud huts, kind of like Saudis. You remember Saudis out in the prairie? They would cut grass, build a mud hut, and they lived in there. And every day they prayed for an opportunity. Lord, let us talk to those people. And they were not allowed. There was no contact. The only contact they had was once a week. A little boy was sent out from the village who offered to sell them eggs and some other things. Chickens and eggs, I think, is what he offered to sell them. But he was under strict instructions from the chief. Don't you talk to those people. You do your business, you drop the stuff off, you get your payment, and you leave. But don't talk to those people. That's dangerous. That's the only contact they had. It's discouraging. And here they are, thousands of miles from their comfortable home. They're in a strange place with strange customs, strange food, a strange language. They've given everything up to follow God, and it isn't working. And eventually, all of them get malaria. Now they're sick. And that was enough to convince the Ericsons we've had enough. They pulled up stakes and went back to the mission station. Now David and Savea are alone there in the mud hut with their two-year-old boy. Utterly alone. And it's at that point that Savea made a discovery. David, she said, I'm pregnant. Pregnant in the middle of nowhere. I don't know about you, but at that point, if I was on the Missionary Society board, I probably would have let him off the hook. Look, that's more than we could ask for anybody. You're expecting a child, you've had malaria, you're sick, it's not working. Why don't you go home and when your children are older you can come back in. We completely get it. I mean, if you were on the board, you'd probably let him off the hook too. You'd understand. But there was this fire in that couple's hearts that told them stay. And so their little daughter, Ina, they named her, was born in a mud hut on a little hill half a mile from the village of Endelera. And 17 days later, Svea was dead from complications. Can you trust God with your future? I don't know what you've gone through in your life, so I don't know if you can imagine this or not. But try and put yourself in David's shoes. There he is in the middle of nowhere. He's got a toddler. He's got a brand new baby. And the body of his wife. How in the world do you deal with that? How do you have a funeral all by yourself? There's no funeral home, there's no flowers, there's no silk lined casket, no cards from church members, none of the stuff that we count on to get us through those tough moments in life. He's by himself. All he has is a shovel, a little plot of ground behind the hut, and a little homemade white cross that he made himself to put on her grave. That's it. What's he going to do when the baby starts crying? Sad truth is, for David, it was too much. He cracked. 
Like John the Baptist, he started to ask questions. He started to wonder, did I just imagine this whole thing? I mean, did I want to hear from God so badly that I just kind of made it up in my mind? Is that why I'm here? It was too much for him. So he packed his bags, he left the hut, left his wife there buried by the hut, went back to the mission station, and when he got there, took the baby, Ina, gave her to the Ericsons at the missionary station and said, here, you take care of her. I don't know what to do with a baby. He went to Sweden. Why is the story of John the Baptist in the Bible? I mean, that story. I'm convinced it's there for people like Dave. I'm convinced it's there for me and for you. Because even though the Bible says run with patience, patience is the first thing you lose when the heat is on. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and they're angry with God because the evidence of their senses suggests that God isn't there anymore. Pastor, I can't get a job. Who good's following God? I thought he'd provide for my need. I thought he was going to take care of me. I can't get a job. I don't know how I'm going to make rent. I don't know how I'm going to make the mortgage. And we're going to be out on the street. Where is he? Angry. Can't fix my marriage, Pastor. My wife packed up and left last night. So what good has all of this been? Pastor, I'm not even 40 years old and I'm losing my eyesight. I'm going blind. My girls aren't even done growing up yet. How can this be? I wanted to walk them down the aisle one day. It's never going to happen. They're going to have to walk me down the aisle. Angry. You been there? I have. I mean, if I'm really honest, I have. It's one thing to tell people, don't ever get angry. It's another thing to have your world collapse and discover how hard it is not to. Happened to me. Nearly bought the farm three years ago. I wondered, I've got little girls I've got to raise. Lord, how can this be? I've got a thriving ministry. How can this be? Not now. Patience is the first thing we forget when the heat is on. I'm convinced that's why that story's there. Because everybody at some point in their life needs it. It's there for you. The moment is coming when the evidence of your senses is going to tell you you're wrong. If it hasn't happened to you yet, it's going to. So pay attention. I mean, read prophecy carefully. If it doesn't happen in your individual life, it's going to happen to us as believers. I mean, back in Elijah's day, Elijah's on Mount Carmel and he prays and fire comes down from God out of heaven and Elijah's completely vindicated. The miracles are in the right place. But in the last days, according to Revelation 13, it's the second beast who brings fire down from heaven. And the evidence of your senses are going to tell you the miracles are happening in the wrong place. It's coming. It's a caution. Don't build your whole faith on miracles. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples. All of a sudden, they're able to tell the story of Jesus to all those people in all those different languages miraculously. And the evidence is in the right place. But in the last moments before Jesus comes, it says in Revelation 13 that the image of the beast is who speaks to the whole world. And it says in Revelation 16 that three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. In the last days, the miracles happen in the wrong place. What if somebody were to fake the second coming? Oh, it wouldn't happen. No? No? 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about the coming of the lawless one. In the original language, it uses the word parousia. That's only used for the second coming of Christ, except in that one instance. In that one instance, it talks about the lawless one who miraculously appears. In the final moments of this earth's history, what is the evidence of your senses going to tell you? The only thing we're going to have in the end is what the Word says. And the question will be whether we choose to stand on it in spite of what our senses are telling us. I sometimes wonder, what's going through Abraham's mind? As Abraham stands outside the cave of Machpelah, what's he thinking? Five minutes after he buries his wife, what's he thinking about? Because she followed him. Years on the trail, following the promise of God, here he is, standing outside of her tomb, hundreds of miles from home, and she never saw the promise come true. 
All that stuff they went through together, the, the incident with the kings of Egypt, the problems with the kings in the valley of Siddim. And at the end of the day, as he buries Sarah, he really doesn't have anything to show for the promise at all. I mean, all he has is God's promise. That's it. So you've got to wonder, as he's standing there outside of her grave, what in the world is he thinking about? Does he remember the day that he told her they were moving? Comes into the kitchen. Sarah, there's something we need to talk about. What is it, Abraham? Man, I knew there was something. You just haven't been yourself lately. Oh, 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 oh don't tell me it's not because... We don't have children yet. I know all the neighbors talk about that, that we can't have children. And so you're not about to, no, no, Sarah, relax, I love you. I'm not going to leave you. Well, what is it? I've been speaking to God. And he's been speaking to me. What's he been speaking to you about? Well, he says we've got to move. Well, moving, that's not so bad. Because there's that new gated community, Abraham, on the other side of Ur. they got four-bedroom houses with running water. That's not an exaggeration. In the ancient city of Ur, they had four-bedroom houses with running water. They were not primitives. That's not so bad. they got a clubhouse and a pool. No, no, no. I don't quite mean move, Sarah. I mean leave. And where exactly do you suggest we leave to, Abraham? I get those Time Life books in the mail, and they have atlases, and I'm telling you that outside of the Middle East, there's not a whole lot out there except some barbarian tribes. And I don't know if you've ever seen them, bone through the nose, stuff written all over their face. I, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't want to leave here, but we have to. He asked me to, and I love him. Abraham can probably remember it like it was yesterday, and now he's standing outside her grave. And she's dead, and she never saw the promise. Ever. She gave it all up to follow him. And all Abraham has at this point is the promise of God. That's it. He had to buy a grave because he still didn't have any land. What's he thinking about? He just has the promise of God. That's it. Abraham, God said, go for a walk. Go for a walk. Anywhere you walk, you're going to own it. The foot in Bible prophecy is a symbol of ownership. It is. It, it represents ownership. That's why ancient soldiers, when they were about to kill their enemy, put their foot on their throat and did that little battle cry and lopped their head off. I own you. That's what it means. Foot is a symbol of ownership. When in the book of Ruth, Boaz is trying to determine who has the right to the field, they exchange a shoe. It's a symbol of ownership. It's a powerful symbol of ownership. That's why I'm convinced. When Jesus comes, you notice, we're caught up into the air to be with him, and he takes us back to where he is. But he never touches the ground. Why? Because when we get there, he opens the books, we go through the books, and we see all of history, we get all of our questions answered, and then in Zechariah 14, when that phase of the judgment is finished, we come back here, and at that moment, Jesus' foot touches the earth. It's his. He lays claim to it after all the questions have been answered. It's a final declaration. This planet does belong to the Son of God. Abraham, go for a walk. Everything you touch is going to be yours. I am so sure about what's going to happen at the cross. I am so sure about my plan for salvation. I am so sure about the results of the judgment. Go for a walk. It's yours. I think about that every morning when I go for my walk. I don't own much. But with every step, I'm stepping on something that Jesus says will be mine in Him. Waldensians had to run into the wilderness, but their feet were running across ground that eventually would belong to them when Jesus comes. John Huss tied to a stake. The flames are licking at his feet. But he's not just standing on a pile of wood. He's standing on ground that belongs to Jesus and he'll be back. Jesus walks to the cross, struggling under the weight of the wood. And with every footstep on his way to Calvary, he is taking another step on a bit of earth that he will be taking back from the clutches of the devil. It's his. This world is full of disappointment because someone else has laid claim to it. And he's trying very hard to prove that it's his. 
But nothing will stop God's plan to take it back and give it to you. In Jesus. Little Ina got handed to the Ericsons in the mission station. And David, broken, bitter, and angry, went back home. Here, he said, you raise this baby. I don't know how to raise this baby. You take her. He left. Eight months later, the Ericsons succumbed to malaria, and they both died. So Ina got handed to an American couple that happened to be over there, and they renamed her. They said, Ina's not that American. Let's change it. And they called her Aggie, changed her name to Aggie, and they took her back here to the States. So instead of growing up in the Belgian Congo, little Aggie grew up in South Dakota. And in South Dakota, she went to Bible college. And there in Bible college, she met Dewey, and she fell in love with Dewey, and she married him, and they moved to Seattle, where eventually over the years, Dewey became the president of a Christian college there on the West Coast. And life was really good. And then one day, more than two decades after they got married, she goes to get the mail, and for some reason, there's a magazine in the mail that she has never asked for or subscribed to, and the whole thing's in the Swedish language. That's odd, she thought. She took it home, and she began to thumb through it. Couldn't read it, but just kind of looking through it, and as she got near the middle of the magazine, all of a sudden, there's this picture in it that makes her heart stop cold. It's black and white. It's a picture of a little grave somewhere in Africa with a white cross on top of it and written in pencil on the cross is this name, Svea Flood. And I don't know how she knew. I don't know how she knew, but she sensed somehow that that picture was important. So she got in her car, she went down to the college and found a faculty member that could read the Swedish language. She said, I have got to know what this story is about. Tell me what it says. What does it say? So he sat at his desk, he read through it, he said, well, Aggie, it's the story about some missionaries who a very long time ago went to go and witness to a little village in the Belgian Congo and they had a baby out there and the mother died. It's a very sad story. That's the mother's grave. Was well, there any more? What else does it say? Well, it says that once a week, I mean, they had a hard time. They had no results, but once a week this little boy came out of the village to sell them eggs. And when he did, Svea would just whisper a few words about Jesus in his ear before he ran back to the village. And when he grew up, he gave his heart to Christ. And he came back to the village and he convinced the chief to let him build a school. And eventually all the students in that school, in that village, they accepted Christ. And when the parents found out what they were studying and they heard about the love of Christ, they all gave their lives to Jesus too. And at the very end, the chief who wouldn't let anybody in, he broke down and gave his life to Christ. And the whole village is Christian. The whole thing. I don't know how she knew it. But instinctively she knew that was her mom and dad. And she was the baby in the story. Some of her friends at the college for her 25th wedding anniversary got her tickets to Sweden. She thought, I wonder if my dad's alive. I'm going to go find him. He needs to know. When she got there, she found out that he had remarried. She had a whole bunch of half-brothers and sisters she didn't know she had. What a time they had the first evening. I'd imagine. They talked late into the night, and then Aggie said, Hey, the real reason I'm here, is Dad still alive? Yeah, he is. Would you like to see him? We could take you. Oh, yeah. I want him to know what God did after he left. Oh, whatever you do, do not mention God to him. He hates God. Hates him. Aggie didn't care. Take me anyway. She, she got there, and he lived in a tiny apartment, and the door was hanging open. He hadn't bothered to close it the night before. She opened it a little bit, peered in, and there was a thin, frail man on a rumpled bed, and there were liquor bottles all over the floor. Through the dark, her heart went out to him. She cried out, Daddy, Daddy, it's me. He rolled over and saw her silhouette in the door. And he knew who it was almost immediately. Ina, he said, Ina, can you ever forgive me? She said, of course I can forgive you. And she went to the bed and sat down. She picked him up and held his frail body in her arms. Oh, of course, Papa, of course I forgive you. And you know it's all okay now because God took care of me. He 
stiffened up in her arms. Don't you talk about God to me. I gave him everything and he let me down. He failed me and nothing good came out of it. But Papa, you don't understand. It really happened. If you'd only stayed, they all came to Jesus. The whole village. There are 600 people in a church there because of you. And three weeks before he died, David gave his heart back to Jesus. Amen. Two years later, Aggie went to a Christian conference in England, a big conference, and she heard a report from the superintendent of the National Church of Zimbabwe. It used to be called the Belgian Congo. She said, he's from the Belgian Congo. I wonder if he's ever heard our story. And she approached the guy after he was done speaking. She said, I don't mean to bother you, but I'm wondering, have you ever heard of David and Savea Flood? Have I heard of David and Savea Flood? He said, of course, when I was a little boy, once a week I used to bring them eggs. What's let you down? If it hasn't happened to you, it will. Where did your heart break? Mine was crushed. And there comes a moment in your life where all you have is God's promise. Run with patience, it's good. It's good. Abraham feels a hand on his shoulder. Abraham, wake up! Somebody's breaking into the tent. And Abraham draws the first breath he's drawn in thousands of years. And he opens one eye and he sees who's in the door of the tent. He says, Sarah, it's not a thief. Don't worry, it's an angel. Come on, Abraham, Sarah. Time to go. It's time to go home. I've been waiting for this for a long time. We can go now. And Abraham gets there to the courts of heaven. In my mind's eye, I see him in the library because you know there's got to be a library in a place as wonderful as heaven. <laughs> and imagine what he gets to study. Everything after the book of Genesis is new to him. Sixty-five books he's never heard of. Well, Genesis hadn't been written either, but he lived most of it. And he's studying there in heaven's library and he's going through. He gets to imagine Abraham in the book of Daniel. Doing the math in Daniel 8 of the 2,300 days and then the cleansing of the sanctuary will come and he's mapping it out. Oh, look at that, 1844, right on schedule. And as he's charting it out on a piece of paper on heaven's library table, he bumps into a guy. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. No problem, says the other guy. Kind of interesting stuff, isn't it? It sure is. I've been reading about David and I've been reading about the temple in Jerusalem and I've been reading about Babylon. I'm Abraham, by the way. Oh, I'm John. I'm reading the book of Acts because I'm desperate to know what happened after they lopped my head off. <laughs> and then it happens. That moment you dream of. There's a hand on his shoulder and he knows who it is. Before he even looks, Abraham, welcome home. I've waited so long for you to get here. Oh Jesus, it's so wonderful. It's better than I ever hoped. Abraham, I want you to put down the books for a minute because I need to show you something. What is it? Just, just come with me. And in my mind's eye, I see them walk out of the library to a big balcony. And there in front of the balcony is a numberless throng that no man can count. See, Abraham, I told you, your descendants would be like the sand of the sea. And there they are. And those people cheer when Abraham comes out on the platform. Abraham says, look at that, Lord. They sure love you. I know they love me. But that cheers for you because I kind of made a promise that they could come from the east and the west and sit down and have dinner with you. And well, today's the day. Even when all you have is the promise, 
promise is good. Run with patience. It's good. My grandfather, I discovered, and he was a godly man. He prayed all his life that I would be a preacher. And when he died, there was no hope of it. <laughs> when he died, nobody would have hoped for it. I was so stubborn. I cheated him of that answer to prayer, really. I didn't even find out about it until a week after I was ordained as a gospel minister. Somebody came to me and said, did you know your grandfather prayed for this to the day he died? He went to his grave with nothing but a promise. I can't wait for heaven. Amen. The look on his face when he sees me there. <laughs> the all kinds of people who have a look on their face when they see me there. <laughs> it's true. It's all true. God gives us enough prophecy so that you can cling to it. If all this is true, the last part is too, says God. And even when the evidence of your senses tells you it's not true, it is. And in a heartbeat, I'm coming back. What broke your heart? Don't let it. Cling to it. His word is good.